You're listening to Shaping Opinion, a production of O'Brien Communications. O'Brien Communications is a corporate communications consultancy that can be found at O'BrienCommunications.com. To connect with us at Shaping Opinion, go to Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. If you enjoy the podcast, please rate and review it on Apple Podcasts. When you rate and review on iTunes, you help more listeners like you find us. T-minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 12, 11, 10, 9. Ignition sequence start. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Tower cleared. Here we got a roll program. Neil Armstrong reporting the roll and pitch program, which puts Apollo 11 on a proper heading. Rod, do you remember the Apollo 11 moon landing and where you were? I remember it vividly, and I was in the living room of my home, as I think most people our age were at that time. I was, uh, I think, 11. And we had a probably 16-inch black and white television, and it was one of the most magical moments of my life, followed closely by seeing the landing of Viking 1 on Mars at Caltech. But, of course, Apollo 11 was special because there were humans on the moon. And I remember very vividly listening to the audio, the the scratchy audio, because they were having trouble keeping communications going as the two astronauts were landing. And then I remember listening to them as, as Armstrong wormed his way out of the lunar module and got down the ladder. And partway down the ladder, he pulled that latch and the camera deployed. And of course, as you probably recall, for the first 30 seconds or so, the image was upside down. <laughs> And they had to throw a switch at the Goldstone tracking station to get it right side up. And then there he was. And it was ghostly and soft and fuzzy and just miraculous. It was such an incredible moment, as were all the moonwalks, really. And the further we get away from it, the more I I almost have to remind myself that this actually happened. Because it's a big deal to try and do it again today. It's a miracle that we pulled it off when we did. Because... The technology of the time was pretty borderline, and they were out there right on the ragged edge. So the fact that it went as well as it did and we never lost anybody in flight just blows my mind to this day. Tim O'Brien. In this episode of the Shaping Opinion podcast, we're joined by Rod Pyle. He's a space author, journalist, and historian who's written for Space.com, Live Science, The Huffington Post, Wired, and others. The premise of our podcast is simple. We talk about people, events, and things that have shaped the way we think. Today we're going to talk with Rod about the most historic space flight of all time, Apollo 11. On July 20th of this year, the country and the world will mark the 50th anniversary since the historic voyage of Apollo 11, when man first stepped foot on the moon. That event was the fulfillment of a promise John F. Kennedy made as president in a speech to Rice University on September 12, 1962. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win. In less than seven years, the United States developed the systems, the technologies, and the ability to do something that mankind had never before achieved. In 2019, it may be difficult to imagine just how big it was, 
You would have to go to the history books to read about ancient mariners who discovered never-before-seen lands and cultures. Only with Apollo 11, it was different. Man has always been able to see the moon, but it wasn't until Apollo 11 that he could actually walk on it. Thanks to the technology of the day, millions around the world were able to see and hear history in real time, though the imagery left much to be desired. In episode 50, we talked about one of the low points for NASA, which was the Challenger disaster. In this episode, we will talk about the highest of highs for NASA. Rod Pyle has written a book about Apollo 11 called First on the Moon, with a foreword written by one of the first men on the moon, Buzz Aldrin. His book features many stunning photos and illustrations, along with some rarely seen documents that tell the story of the first men on the moon. Rod, would you mind telling us about yourself and how you became a space author, journalist, and historian? So when I was a kid in elementary school in the 1960s, I began reading a lot of science fiction, kind of at an early age, and got really enraptured by it. And I thought, I want to know more about what's really happening. So I went to the library at my elementary school and looked for all the wonderful space books I was sure they had. And they had, I think, two, the big golden book of space exploration, and I forget the title of the other one. And all the rockets look like V2s from World War II. They're all these big silver bananas out of a Bugs Bunny cartoon or something. And I thought, this isn't real space flight. So I started bugging my parents to get me some of the real thing. And at that point, Gemini was flying. So right towards the end of Gemini, beginning of Apollo, I just became a fanatic about it. So our other kids were collecting baseball cards and worshiping their favorite football player. I was the guy in the corner huddled there with, with my Matt Mason toys, which were a line of space toys from the 1960s that I treasured. So moving into college, I thought, well, I love astronomy, so I'll major in astronomy and try and work my way out from there. So I went to UCLA. That lasted about a year and a half till I got into the heat of differential equations and realized that astronomy was all math and that calculus and I weren't friends. So we parted company and I headed off towards a media direction and took a long diversion into TV commercials and educational filmmaking for the classroom and so forth. But always at the top of this was this notion of, boy, you know, when I get all this lower rung climbing behind me, what I really want to do is talk about space in the media and share this passion with, with the larger audience. So the short version of this is I got an opportunity to work for the History Channel for a number of years, and a few of those shows were about uh, space, particularly about Apollo. And I really loved doing that. It was such a pleasure to go through the footage and write the scripts and interview the astronauts and authors like Andrew Chaikin, who was quite big at the time. And that whole process was just delightful. But the hard part was trying to condense either the whole Apollo program or even just one mission into 44 minutes of TV. And then you lose some of that time because in the new act, you have to recap the old act, the outgoing one and all that. And I thought, this is like writing for TV Guide or I guess from today's perspective, trying to tell it by Twitter. And I really wanted to be able to sort of expand the story and roll around in it and cherish it and just enjoy really putting it out in a way that I felt gave you not just the facts, but the feeling of it, the feeling of being alive at that time. And so in 2003 or four, I started writing books about it. First one was an audio book, then came my first physical book for Smithsonian. And I haven't looked back. It's, it's once you get into the bliss of writing those things, it's hard to do much of anything else. I've tried to do some corporate writing from time to time. It's always a challenge to stay focused when what you really want to do is go back and talk about space, right? I mean, you do this for a living, so I admire your focus. I have a little more trouble with that. And um, I've written, I think, 15 books now, plus a handful that I write for NASA JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which is just, just up the hill from where I live. And it's uh, been incredible. And then, uh, luckily for me, last year, 2018, I was asked to come in and edit uh, a magazine for the National Space Society. They have a quarterly called Ad Astra, and they were looking for an editor. And I said, well, I haven't done that before, but I've written for magazines, so I'll give it a try. And it's interesting, as you probably experienced, stepping over that line from only writing or authoring to being an editor, because now you see what you put your editors through for all those years. <laughs> and that was kind of transformational. But uh, now I do both, and I just love it. 
it's a real luxury to be able to focus on one industry like you have because one thing informs another after you work on one project. In fact, actually, if you look at certain people like Ken Burns, for example, a documentarian, one you'll see hints of a future documentary in one of his current ones. Or if you look at one of his documentaries now, you can find roots of it in a former work. So I, I always think that when you can focus on one industry or one subject, you can really just immerse yourself in it and it, be, it makes your future work even better. That, that actually brings me, though, to what we're talking about today, the Apollo 11 mission. I'll just recap the basics, what brought Apollo 11 to where it was. John F. Kennedy framed it in a 1962 speech, and when he framed it, he basically said the space program was to beat the Soviet Union into space, in so many words, It was about national and world security, but to set the tone, he wanted to make sure that everyone understood that the mission to space was in the name of peace, not war, even though it seemed very clearly to gain a military and and an edge over the Soviet Union on the world stage. How important was that promise that John F. Kennedy made in 1962 in the early 60s to pressuring NASA to land on the moon in the 1960s? It was absolutely critical, and uh, there's a lot of us, including myself until a handful of years ago, who were kind of pining for and waiting for that next presidential proclamation that was going to come out, we hoped, and set the stage for a new initiative to go beyond Earth orbit. And we waited, and we waited, and we saw George H.W. Bush try it. We saw George Bush try it. We saw, in a sense, we saw President Obama try it. And none of them really gained any traction. You know, they they got people excited for a while. And NASA said, okay, we're reshuffling the deck again, probably muttering under their breath like we have to do every 48 years. Thank you very much. And um, the problem is the funding just never followed through. So famously, Constellation, which George W. Bush announced in 2004, which is going to be our return to the lunar surface with the Orion spacecraft and what became the SLS was then called the Constellation Booster and the Altair Lander was not fully funded. And by the time Obama came into office, we had had the Augustine report that said, look, we're never going to get this done at the rate we're going. So that got scrapped and we moved off to the asteroid rendezvous mission, which was then dumped when Trump came into office. So we've seen a lot of these, these false starts, these false dawns, if you will, And we're not going to have another Kennedy moment, I don't think, because that, as you pointed out, was very geopolitically driven. And when you look, it's funny, I see articles all the time about, usually in kind of secondary media, about, you know, the great groundswell of support that America had for Apollo, and that's why it happened and so forth. And that's, if you look at it closely, that's really not the case. You know, the, the public support from various polls, including Gallup and others, came and went. So Kennedy made his announcement. People kind of scratched their heads and said, well, that's kind of unusual, but yeah, that's exciting. So there was a a a bump in support there and then it dwindled a bit. And then Gemini held people's interest for a while, but there were 12 Gemini flights. So as that program progressed, people wondered what was going on. And unless you followed the news pretty carefully, you didn't really understand the intricacies of all these little steps they were taking to rendezvous, rendezvous and docking, EVA in case we needed to leave the spacecraft during an Apollo flight and so forth. So that began to lose interest. Apollo 1 fire, of course, got people interested, but not for the reasons we would have liked. And then I think Apollo 8 really sort of lit the fire again. This was 1968. We had only had one flight of Apollo hardware and nobody, no people had flown on a Saturn V yet. It was just with a smaller Saturn 1 rocket. And it was a real daring thing that they decided to do. We're going to, on on the first flight of the booster with people on it, and only the second flight of the command module, and with no lunar module as a lifeboat, if there's a problem, we're going to send these guys in lunar orbit. And I think that really got people fired up. And then, of course, Apollo 11, obviously, people got extremely interested worldwide. And then interest began to wane dramatically again. So it's hard, the public's very fickle, and it's hard to keep them focused on these things. And This is something that NASA struggles with this day. I just wrote a book called Space 2.0 about the coming space age, where I have a chapter about why space. And it's it's a struggle to keep people engaged and interested in what's new up there. You try to tell people about the amazing things happening in the space station that goes overhead every 90 minutes. And it's the biggest machine ever built. It's the most expensive machine ever built. 
it's doing incredible work up there. It's been there for 20 years, had no major failures, and yet most people just kind of yawn and go, yeah, and, and a fair percentage of people go, uh, is that that one that crashed? They think Skylab in the 70s. You go, no, no, it's still up there. So there's a lot of misconceptions, and it's a tough message to, to weave successfully and get out there, but that's what people like you and I spend a good part of our lives doing. But to get back to your core question, I think, I think I think two things are critical. One, Kennedy's proclamation that this was going to be a peaceful mobil the largest peaceful mobilization of a workforce and initiative and effort probably in history. And then two, sadly, when he was assassinated, we had a martyred president's program that was a political hot potato that nobody was going to shoot down. A few people tried, famously Walter Mondale, and he didn't fare well. So um, I think that was also critical, was the fact that, that Kennedy had made this proclamation and then was no longer with us, and Lyndon Johnson and others decided this, this absolutely had to be followed through. Well, now we have the luxury of 2020 hindsight, so we do know that later on we did land on the moon. Uh, as you said, public support was mixed over the years, but... The launch happened on July 16th, 1969 from Cape Kennedy, and it, before it left Earth's atmosphere, it orbited for two hours, then it accelerated to escape Earth's gravity. Three days later, Apollo 11 entered lunar orbit, and the lunar module landed on July 20th with the words, the eagle has landed. So that was the moment that everyone remembers. I, I, I don't know if it was so much the eagle landing on the lunar surface or Neil Armstrong's first step that was a, a more significant moment for that time. But can you describe, they landed on the Sea of Tranquility. That was the name of the place on the moon where they landed. I think it was chosen because it was a relatively smooth and level surface, but there were some hitches in the descent of the lunar module going down to the moon's surface. Can you describe what happened there? Because a lot of people know the success of the event, but they don't know how risky it was during the actual landing process. It, it was risky during the landing process, and it was risky just given the, the, landing, the landing itself was risky, but it was also risky given the characteristics of the hardware they were using. So the lunar module had never been landed on another another world surface of any kind. You couldn't test it that way. It couldn't fly unmanned. So this was the first time they had done on Apollo 10, kind of a trial run, taking it down to within a few dozen miles of the surface and then boosting back up on the ascent stage. So it had a, a landing stage and a, a departure stage and it separated. So everything, they knew everything worked, but they still hadn't actually done it. So this was going to be the first time and odds quietly mumbled within NASA itself were about 50-50 for success on that first landing. Hopefully not 50-50 in terms of keeping the crew alive and bringing them back, but at least 50-50 in terms of successfully landing and not having to abort or something. So they, they separated from the command module, and uh, Mike Collins gave them a, a, a good look to make sure the landing legs were down and locked, that everything looked to be in order, and it was. And off they went. And they fired the descent engine to head down out of lunar orbit and almost immediately began dropping out of radio contact with Mission Control. So here's Gene Kranz, the flight director for that flight down in Mission Control. He's right on the borderline of being able to continue because the communications are coming and going and very scratchy. Buzz Aldrin's on the lunar module trying to reorient the antenna manually to get a better signal. So they had two antennas, one direct and one what they called omnidirectional. The omnidirectional was good enough for the data to go back, but it wasn't good enough for, for solid voice communications. So uh, there was a lot of concern about that. And even their telemetry, which is the sort of back channel that gives them just digital information on the overall condition and functioning of the spacecraft was cutting in and out. So it was kind of 50-50 whether they were going to be able to continue. But as Kranz later put it, he said, you know, Neil Armstrong was the man on site, on the job. He was the commander of the mission. And as far as as uh, Kranz felt, it was really his decision unless there was something dramatically wrong. So they continued, and they continued to descend, and things were going swimmingly until uh, two things happened. First, Armstrong noticed as he was looking out the window, and they had hatch marks in the window, little etchings that were supposed to line up with landmarks on the lunar surface that were uh, had been mapped by other Apollo flights. He noticed they were coming in long. They were overshooting their landing zone, 
And this was because there was some residual air in the tunnel that docked the lunar module and command module. And when they separated, they had accounted for everything, rates of springs that are pushing them apart and everything else in the trajectory calculations, but they had not accounted for that extra bit of air. So there was a little kind of a champagne cork-like pop when they separated, which gave the lunar module a little more speed than they had planned on. So it was landing long. So the second problem they had was this computer issue. They had a machine called the Apollo Guidance Computer, the AGC, which is really a miracle of its time. It was the first time anything of that type had been reduced down to a flyable size. It was essentially a computer that should have been the size of a, a, van, a cargo van that had been reduced to the size of a briefcase and was not very powerful. It was about 36K by today's measurements. Not, not megabytes, not, not terabytes, but kilobytes. <laughs> But it was just enough to do the job. And uh, that computer had hardwired programs in it that were designed to get them down to the lunar surface and then back up to orbit to rendezvous with the command module when they were done. But it also had some fail-safe mechanisms programmed in. And so on the way down, because of a switch set in the wrong position, not because Alder made a mistake, but because the, the procedures were written up in a way that hadn't checked everything due to how quickly they were moving, there was too much data going into the computer from two radars instead of one, and they didn't match. So the computer locked up, and all the flight data, the range of the surface and the speed and everything else they needed just stopped, and it just displayed this 1202 number. And Armstrong said, hey, we've got a computer alarm here. It's a 1202. What is it? And there's this long silence from the ground while they're looking because while uh, one of the controllers fortunately had a crib sheet, and was able to look this up, it took some time because this wasn't something they were very familiar with. It had occurred in one or two simulations beforehand, but it wasn't something anybody thought would happen. So basically the computer was saying, I've got too much work to do, I'm gonna stop and start with the important stuff all over again. So it's kind of like a soft reset in today's terminology. And uh, it occurred two or three more times as they were making their way down, but they got the assurance from the uh, Capcom, Charlie Duke, another Apollo astronaut, that everything was fine. They could continue. And then uh, close to the surface, Armstrong took over manual control anyway. So if you listen to the downlink from that landing, you'll hear Buzz Aldrin reading off the figures from the computer, their range of the surface, their speed laterally and so forth. And uh, Armstrong is just focused intently out that window, trying like hell to find a safe place to land. Because you pointed out the Sea of Tranquility was, was chosen because it was fairly smooth and feature-free and relatively bland, so it looked safe. But that's from orbit. So you get closer and you start seeing all those craters and rocks and boulders. And anything over about 18 inches could have imperiled the lander. And that was there was a lot of that down there, including boulders the size of, of moving vans. So Armstrong's flying horizontally at a fairly high clip desperately finding a place to try and to try to find a place to set down and of course the fuel's dropping they didn't have a lot of excess fuel to do this this was very early in the space program and uh you know it was very touch and go so if you read the the oral histories later armstrong says you know everybody was extremely tense downstairs at mission control and i understood that but i knew that even if we ran out of gas when we were 40 or 50 feet above the lunar surface because of the low gravity and the way the LEM was designed, if they just dropped with no propulsive power at all, as long as they weren't moving sideways, they'd probably be okay because those legs had a lot of crushability built in and they would have been all right. But still, when you're hearing them say 60 seconds, 30 seconds, fuel at 5%, it's, it's very nerve wracking and, and you really get, I still get sweaty palms when I listen to that. So they did set down successfully. And as you said, those famous words, tranquility base here, Eagle has landed. Charlie Duke kind of muttering, <laughs> trank, 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 tranquility, we, we hear you loud and clear, it was just a, a really magical, galvanizing moment. Okay, engine stop. APA at a descent. Both control, both auto, descent, engine command override off. Engine arm off. 413 is in. We copy you down, Eagle. Houston, uh... Tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. And everything went perfectly after that, except for they had one one near miss. A few minutes after they had gotten on the lunar surface, the cold from the moon's surface began to soak up into the lower stage of the lunar module, 
and an ice plug formed in a fuel line and it had still had enough fuel in it that pressure started building up. So the guys in Mission Control who have just weathered this knuckle biter landing have breathed this big sigh of relief and then somebody says, uh, guys, <laughs> there's, there's bad pressure reading on this console. So they called together all the people from the contractor, Grumman and TRW, who had, Grumman had built the LEM and TRW had built the descent engine, and say, uh, what are we going to do about this? Should we even tell them? You know, should we abort? What should we do? And the pressure kept going up and up and up. And there was a relief disc that would have blown it had gotten too high. But even that has some dangers. You don't want anything exploding in that lower stage. And the worst case scenario was that the whole engine or fuel tank would explode. And that could imperil the astronauts and keep them from getting home. So uh, they watched it for a while. And just as they were getting to the point where they knew they were going to have to make a call one way or the other, apparently the ice plug melted because of residual heat in the engine. The pressure dropped and everything was fine. Moonwalk went on for two and a half hours, and the rest is history. Without even knowing that, everybody was just so, they were so proud of what America had accomplished because it was portrayed as, as an American achievement in the, against the background of a Soviet space race. Could you describe then, once the astronauts landed on the moon, they had a mission, they had certain things they needed to do. Can you describe some of the things that the astronauts had to accomplish during the two and a half hours that they were out on the lunar surface? Absolutely. And they had a timeline that was packed like nobody's business. They, it was not realistic for a first visit to get all these things done. But you had a whole bunch of science people at NASA and at universities all over the country putting in requests for things they wanted in terms of what kind of samples they wanted, where they wanted them from experiments that were to be deployed on the surface. There was a handful of experiments that they had to set up, and each one required a certain amount of attention and finesse to get it working. They had to take time out to receive a phone call from President Nixon in the Oval Office, so tens of millions of dollars were spent while they were standing there listening to Nixon have his moment in the sun, even though it wasn't his space program, arguably. And um, it was a really packed schedule. So they, they got out of the lunar module, which was a little bit of a challenge in itself because they vented out the atmosphere because you need to equalize the, the pressure between the inside and the outside of the limb. And the door still wouldn't open. And Buzz is tugging on it and Neil's tugging on it and they're trying to figure out, you know, we've opened the valves, why the heck isn't this working? And finally Buzz got frustrated and reached up to the upper left corner of the hatch and actually flexed it. That, that's how lightly the limb was built. There were parts of it that weren't much thicker than a Coca-Cola can. And he flexed it just enough that the air hissed out and they got out on the surface and Neil went down first, Buzz followed about 15 minutes later, and they started scrambling to try and get these chores done. So the first thing Neil was supposed to do is grab what's called a contingency sample. And the idea was, look, just get us a scoop full of dirt and some pebbles in case you have to take off because something goes wrong. We want something for our visit to the moon. He didn't actually do that first. He started snapping pictures because he had this inquisitive engineer's mind, and he saw that part of the limb was in shadowing that would reveal certain details he wanted to capture. So Mission Control is saying, Neil, contingency sample? He says, yeah, yeah, just as soon as I get these pictures. So he finished what he was doing, got his contingency sample, which involved using a scoop and a handle because you couldn't bend over in those moon suits. And uh, then Buzz got down and they started setting up their experiments. So they set up a thing called a solar wind collector that was just really a sheet of aluminum foil on a, on a stand that was meant to try and measure the hard radiation coming from the sun. And then a, a device called the ESAP, the Early Apollo Science Lander Package, I think that's what it was, which was a, a, a little pallet that had a bunch of experiments on it. It had a seismometer and temperature sensors and so forth. And they were going to leave that behind so that would continue to measure the nature of the lunar surface and the environment for a couple of weeks after they left. It was battery powered. Later ones had a, a nuclear power supply and could go on for months and months. So Buzz is struggling with that because he can't get it level. It's got this little ball bearing level in it that, that just won't level out. So he's muttering and grunting and trying to get that set up on the eels off collecting rocks. And collecting rocks is more challenging than one might think. You know, you, you, you look at a surface like the moon, it looks very bland and contiguous and very much one part like looks like another. So you'd think you'd just go get whatever looked interesting, but they had had enough geological training and they had a whole room of geologists back at Mission Control that had set out priorities and were continuing to feed information to Mission Control, telling them what they wanted. So you wanted some old rocks, you wanted some new rocks, you wanted things from 
hopefully inside a crater or that had been blown out of a crater because that's nature's way of saying, I'm drilling a hole for you into the older lunar crust. Here's some, some old rock samples. You wanted dust. You wanted something near the limb that had been hit by the, by the blast coming down. You wanted something farther away from the limb. So there was a lot of different targets that they had to do. And at the same time, Armstrong had instructions that neither of them were to go out of range of the TV camera because they, there was a lot of nervousness around this first mission, which he summarily and fairly quickly disregarded, much to the glee of the geologist down the back room who said later that how amazing Armstrong was because he just took it on his own initiative to go out and stray further from the landing site than he was supposed to because he saw things that looked interesting and things that he thought would be helpful and bring value to the mission. So they scrambled to get all this done. At the same time, had to, of course, also stop and set up the flag and so forth. One other thing that was very challenging was getting core samples. They had these hollow tubes that they were supposed to drive down to the surface with a hammer and pull up that would give you, you know, six to eight inches of, of stratigraphy of the lunar soil, or regolith as they call it, and here Buzz is trying to whack this thing down into the surface, and he's raising the hammer above his helmet, which in that suit is not easy to do, banging on this thing as hard as he can. And every time he let go of the tube, it would start to topple over, so he realized he wasn't making much progress. So they got as good a sample as they could. Later missions took up an electric drill, but even that turned out to be extremely challenging. So we still have some work to do in terms of getting deep core samples from the moon. Uh, they did get a 15-minute extension. They were nearing the end of the time they were supposed to be heading back to the lunar module. Mission Control said, look, your, your backpacks are doing fine. You've got plenty of oxygen. You've got plenty of water. You've got everything you need. We'll give you another 15 minutes. So they wrapped it up. There is some question as to whether Neil had that moment that they show at the end of the movie First Man where he goes over and throws his daughter's medical bracelet, his a daughter who died when she was two many years before, into a crater. There's no proof that it happened. It might have. We don't know. But he certainly did take a moment at one point to just sort of stand there and take in the wonder of it all very briefly. They both did. And then it was time for Buzz to head back into the lunar module. And then Neil followed him back up inside. And right about the time they got settled in, they realized that as Neil was heading out for the, for the moonwalk, his backpack had smacked into a probably not very intelligently placed breaker switch that controlled the ascent engine for the lunar module and it had snapped off and it was in the off position so uh, they scrambled on the ground to try and figure out a workaround so that they could get the ascent engine fired up and get those guys home and then when the time came Buzz Aldrin who's brilliant and extremely resourceful simply took a felt tip pen out of his pocket jammed it in the breaker in the hole flicked the switch back on and the crew was saved for 99 cents. So that was, that was that, and off they went. You know, one of the things that you mentioned in several different ways was the innovative abilities and the uh, intelligence and the knowledge of the crew themselves, Neil Armstrong in particular and Buzz Aldrin. Let's talk about the crew. I, I know that I had read that the crew of Apollo 11 was not selected specifically for this mission. Deke Slayton, who picked the crews, said he was against choosing crews for specific missions. His philosophy was any crew could fly any mission. In his mind, mission objectives changed off, and so any crew had to be able to fly. So they had an order. The, the order was that the backup crew of Apollo 11 would fly three missions later. So if you were the backup crew then of Apollo 8, you would be the Apollo 11 crew. And that's how it worked out somewhat. There was a, there was a switch up with a, a couple of crews, the Apollo 8 crew and the Apollo 9 crew. Whatever happened, it was almost by chance that this crew was the crew of Apollo 11. But can you talk a little bit about the crew, the crew themselves, and what they brought to the mission, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and of course, Michael Collins in the command module? I, I think Michael Collins really summed it up best in one of his books when he said, we were amiable strangers. Uh, they got along well enough. They trained together well enough. They were all capable of doing everything they need, needed to do, but they weren't the kind of people that would have hung out at the bowling alley after work much. As we know about Armstrong, especially if you've seen the film, and I think he was portrayed as being uh, 
much more taciturn in the film than he was because people that, that knew him said he was much more he, he was much more engaging and outgoing than he was portrayed but he was a fairly quiet guy generally didn't didn't talk a lot unless he had something very specific to say which was usually of a technical nature kind of a gentle but extremely ambitious soul and this is a guy that had flown the x-15 which was a pretty brutal ride as you've seen in that film so he he did have nerves of steel and he was extremely capable and brilliant but also very humble and just kind of kept to himself and his his basic philosophy according to his son rick armstrong who we interviewed for uh, another book basically said you know that his father's advice was just just choose something to do and do it well and and that's really what's most important and be kind to your neighbors i mean it was almost this kind of norman rockwell mindset which i think we find so so charming and endearing mike collins is a little bit more of a of a raconteur he's a connoisseur of fine wines and fine food he's a painter now he paints delightful wa- watercolors he was the guy that when he came to your party well, the, some of the other test pilots would be talking about, you know, the dangers of their last test flight and conquests of the past and so forth. Mike would be talking about art and history and culture and philosophy to anybody who was willing and able to sit down and engage him in that conversation. And then you had Buzz, who was really kind of the, I don't think it's fair to call him the odd man out, but he was probably the most different of these guys in terms of the test pilot cadre overall and all the astronauts were test pilots of one type or another at least in the early days buzz had been in combat in korea flown jets but after that he did not go to test pilot school he enrolled at mit because he wanted to do work in orbital dynamics which is something that not many people had studied much and he found it fascinating it really appealed to his intellectual side he also had this struggle with a very domineering father who, even after Buzz got back from the moon, said, hey, that's nice, what's next? So he had something, I guess you could say he had something to prove, and this was something that uh, followed him throughout his professional life and caused him some challenges later on. But one way or another, he enrolled at MIT, he finished his doctorate there, then he went to take an assignment with the Air Force, which is obviously what he had been doing when he was in Korea, would take an assignment at the Air Force in Los Angeles to work on orbital dynamics. And then at that point, finally applied to NASA. And even though he wasn't a test pilot, he was able to get in and began training for his Gemini missions. I think what sets Buzz apart really, though, is this this incredible intellectual capacity. When you talk to him, which I've done for many, many hours, you get the sense that there's four or five different brains in there all kind of trying to get their message out at the same time. So he could talk a lot about technical things at great length, which I personally find kind of challenging because I didn't go to grad school in orbital dynamics or even physics. But it's fascinating stuff, and it's clear that he's just got this brilliant, logical, mathematically driven mind. So it didn't make him terribly popular in the test pilot cadre, I don't think, because you know they wanted to talk more about test pilot things. And he was talking more about space and the future and his vision for where we could go. And the one thing I'll add is he's one of the few people from the space race era in the astronaut uh, cadre that really untiringly and unceasingly continued to fly the flag forever on. I mean, Armstrong did, certainly Gene Cernan did to an extent, but Aldrin really has just continued driving this message of we need to keep going, we need to go beyond, we need to get out of Earth orbit and get back to the moon and move on to Mars. And possibly most importantly, we need to really engage international partners to do this. And that's something that really does kind of set them apart in the conversation. So here are these three guys, very different, but working as a well-oiled machine. And as you said, Slayton's notion was, look, I can swap out any crew on any mission. And to an extent, I can swap out any astronaut to any crew up to a certain point, at least until they start their intensive training. But I think we hit a sweet spot with these three guys in terms of their individual capabilities for that mission. When they were landing on the moon, Aldrin did what he was supposed to do perfectly and calmly, which was keep an eye on the computer and the numbers and make sure that they were going where they needed to go, that all systems were functioning properly. And Armstrong focused with laser-like precision out that window, getting them down to that, that best possible landing spot that they could. And I think without those characteristics and Mike Collins up in the command module patiently waiting for them, we could have had a very different outcome. One of the things that they said that Neil Armstrong did when he landed the lunar module was he did it so gently and so well 
that the lunar module landed softly on the surface. And what that meant was the legs of the lunar module were designed to crumple when they landed a little bit harder so that when it crumpled, the ladder would come down to the moon's surface. Well, what happened was Neil Armstrong landed the, the lunar module so softly that they actually had to jump three feet from the ladder to the ground because he didn't land it as hard as they would expect it. But I wanted to ask you, you mentioned something there about the movie and about the, the moment that Neil Armstrong had by himself. And I think that's one of the other things. When we put ourselves in the shoes of Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong, we want to think, what would we think? I mean, outside of all the jobs we have to do, when you stand there and you look around the, the surface of the moon and possibly then back up to Earth. So what do you know about the moments that <laughs> Neil Armstrong had and Buzz Aldrin had? Well, I, I was never able to ask Neil that question, but I have asked Buzz, and I asked a couple of other moonwalkers, and the common thread of their answers generally are, well, it was just like the simulations. And, I, <laughs> and I, that's not the answer you want, right? You want something kind of expansive and philosophical. So I said, well, okay, the simulations are very good, and they had trained Rockwell, uh, or excuse me, uh, Grumman Aerospace up in Long Island, had built a lunar surface out of concrete and plaster and chicken wire. So I'm sure the training was convincing. And in fact, that's what CBS TV used for their, their simulations when they couldn't get a signal from the lunar surface on flights like Apollo 12. But I said, beyond that, this moment of being somewhere that no human being had been, you've got the whole world watching, blah, blah, blah. You know, I'm trying to get better answers out of them. And most of them just won't rise to the bait. This, the, occasionally, somebody like Gene Cernan would say, well, I... I took a moment to look up at the earth and realized that every human being I had ever known, except for Jack Schmidt, his partner on the lunar surface for Apollo 17, was up on that beautiful little blue ball and what a wonder it was. But uh, the other common thread is we had to get back to work. So I don't think we know that much about what their private thoughts were. It was explored in Jim Hansen's book, First Man, for, for Neil Armstrong. So he does talk a little bit more about his thoughts of the incredible efforts of all the people on earth that had made this happen and how fortunate he was to be there. And both he and Buzz did comment at some length about just the wonder of, of being on the moon. And I think that word is key, that it was really a wondrous experience. And then they, they go back to being engineers and scientists. They talk about how close the horizon looked, how obvious the immediate curvature was, and especially on the Apollo 11 flight, because we hadn't been on the lunar surface before, Something that seems very small to most of us, but was remarkable to both of them, was what happened when they walked around. Besides the fact that they were in a low gravity environment and they could lope with sort of that bunny hop or that that long trot that they did, they were both fascinated by the dynamics of the lunar dirt as they would scuff their boots in it or, or land after taking a hop, because it didn't billow up like it would with a with an atmosphere. It would just kind of fly out in all directions radially in these uh, direct trajectories and then land. And they found that quite fascinating. And that was actually what drove Buzz to take that picture of his boot print, which we've all seen a million times, was scuffing the dirt and watching how the, the dirt particles moved. So I think they found little details like that really, really fascinating. And then just the, the overall kind of contiguous look of the surface, everything was very similar. It was gray, tan, white in places. And it's like a landscape you, that none of them had ever seen anywhere else, except maybe parts of the high desert. But even then, you've got scrub brush and blue sky. So it was just a really a, a stunning appearance to all of them. One of the things I read, too, was that the the smell of the surface, the odor. Uh, they, they asked Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong what it might have smelled like when they were there. And they said it reminded them of the smell of gunpowder and wet ash. That was the, the description they had of what it smelled like, what it looked like. And we all know, too, I, I think the, the whole mission, you talked earlier about the experiments that they conducted, but in general, the whole Apollo 11 mission was a PR event. It was a way for the United States to make that statement that we fulfilled John F. Kennedy's promise that we are number one in space. We are number one over the Soviet Union. We have that edge. 
so they tried to maximize that, and, and a big part of that was taking pictures, taking photographs, taking video, using the television, having that moment where they salute the American flag and leave the American flag. That was a very important part of that two hours that they spent. And they left artifacts. They left a golden olive branch up there. They left an American flag. Uh, they left an Apollo 1 patch. And then they left this moon memorial disc. So those were the kinds of things that they left in addition to some, some what we might now call space junk. But that leads us to, the, to today because we were in the middle of a space race at that time. And you talked about how things are today in the um, American political climate. But China is now working to land somebody on the moon. Would you say there is a new space race in the making? <laughs> it's tempting. Uh, I certainly know a number of people, both inside and outside of NASA, that, that think so. And there's a certain appeal to that, I think, because as Americans, we, we have a competitive spirit. Certainly China does. And uh, China released a white paper a couple of years ago detailing their plans for their future in space. And uh, there was a lot of talk about you know, peaceful approaches and for world benefits and we're going to do it in a very green, environmentally sensitive way and so forth. But they're also very clear about their nationalistic aims, that there is, there's national prestige at stake. It's to forward not just technology and education in China, but national prestige and so forth. So I think that was not made very, very, very well known over here by the press, but that there is sort of this gauntlet being thrown down much more gently than it was by Kennedy in the 1960s, but of China saying, you know, we're right behind you. And if you look at their, their human spaceflight program, it's roughly paralleled what the U.S. and the Soviet Union were doing in the 1960s. Uh, they've done it a bit slower, but it's very directed. It's very linear. One thing builds on another. They don't have these shifts of planning that we have every few years due to changes in the executive office or Congress. And uh, they now have a president for life, so they can make decisions looking forward 10, 15, 20 years, budget them, and keep with them. So they've got a very robust program, as you said. They just landed a robotic lander on the far side. And that was really the first step off the space race trail, I guess, if you, if you look at them as kind of, I don't want to use the word imitating, but emulating what we were doing. This is new. This is something that, that both the United States and Russia spoke about doing but didn't because of the challenges involved, because when you land on the far side, of course, your radio signal to Earth is blocked, so you've got to put up a satellite that holds position off the side of the, of the moon's limb so that you can bounce radio signals back and forth in that satellite. So there's a lot of challenges involved in doing that, and that's kind of a remarkable thing. So there are plans beyond that later this year. China in, intends to return a sample, so they'll be the only the third country to have done that after the U.S. and the Soviets did it with a robotic sample return. And then uh, building up a suite, a cluster of robotic machines to build sort of a robotic research base, they're probably going to start looking at how to utilize lunar resources on the surface because that's something all the spacefaring countries and many private companies, especially the U.S., are interested in, is trying to utilize the resources we find up there, such as water ice, there's a lot of oxygen in the soil, there's metals, there's glass. So these are all things you can refine and use on site without having to launch them for Earth, which is very expensive. And then ultimately, sometime towards the end of the 2020s, early 2030s, China's looking at sending humans. And they've already flown humans in orbit many times and have done two space stations and are building a third that they haven't flown yet. So I think there is a real sense of a race. Now, if you talk to Buzz Aldrin and a number of other people, they'd say, look, let's, uh, there's no need for another race. That's not the way to do it. Let's cooperate. As Kennedy actually tried to, at, at a couple of points, get the Soviet Union to do back before we made the moon landing, there was talk of a cooperation, which didn't go anywhere once he was assassinated, sadly. You know, can we do that now? Well, we have some laws in place in the U.S. that, that prescribe us from doing a lot with China, at least in terms of NASA or any, anything that could be used for defensive or offensive purposes. So that's certainly a hurdle. Intellectual property is another hurdle. Trust is, of course, a part of that. That's a big hurdle. So in a perfect world, I'd like to see cooperation, but I think we're more likely to see competition. I have a little scenario in my head, which I, I haven't shared very many places, but it goes something like this. Sometime around 2025, there's a meeting at the United Nations, and the Chinese assembly asks for permission to have their moment at the podium so they walk up and they invite the American representative up and say, uh, 
hey, we've been keeping this kind of quiet, but here's that that flag you left behind on the moon for Apollo 11. We just wanted to give it back to you. And hey, thanks for the technical leg up. And then, of course, everybody in the audience and in Congress looks at each other and goes, how could you let this happen? And, of course, the answer is we all let it happen because we took our eye off the ball and we stopped spending a significant proportion of our budget on space flight. Back at the height of Apollo, it was about 5% of the federal, federal budget for that program and NASA's other programs. Now it's a tenth of that. And they're flying 10 times as many missions, especially on the unmanned side. So, uh, you know, we, we have some work to do. And the as you know, there's a program called the Lunar Orbiting Platform Gateway, or, and now I think they're just calling it the Gateway, which is to build a smaller version of the International Space Station and fly it in this kind of weird orbit called a halo orbit around the moon that's reconfigurable, and then ultimately use that as a stepping stone to put robotic landers that you can control right there, and also humans back on the lunar surface. But that's not a sure bet yet. So I think my personal opinion is we need to step up the pace. That covers the atmosphere that we're dealing with today with the space race. But there was one thing, and I think Hollywood likes to delve into this whenever they profile these missions and these astronauts, and it's the, the personal conflict that astronauts have with their role as astronauts and American heroes. Can you describe some of the challenges that the astronauts had when they came home back from their mission? Sure, and, and it was different for each of them. Uh, as they segued back into more civilian roles. So for for all three of them, they came home, they re-entered a few days after they left the moon successfully, were immediately at the, at the point that the capsule was still bobbing in the ocean and the Navy frogmen got there and attached the, the flotation to keep it floating until they're able to retrieve uh, the capsule. They opened the hatch and tossed these three isolation garments in and the astronauts had to put on these rubberized biosuits because there were concerns about possible contamination from the moon. You know, some people I think had visions of big tentacled green monsters taking over the planet, but the more realistic concern was there might be something microbial surviving up there that would be of danger. So they put on these suits. Of course, the second they opened the the door to the command module, anything airborne would have been out and free to do its, its business, but nonetheless, it was an attempt. So they put those on, were transferred, to a hermetically sealed Airstream trailer on the aircraft carrier once they uh, were heloed back to the aircraft carrier. And then from there, they went on to Hawaii and then back to Houston where they were put in larger quarters. And they were kept in quarantine for 20 or 21 days until they were released by order of the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta. So that gave them some time to decompress a bit, which turned out to be very fortuitous because everybody knew this was a big event, but even NASA had no idea what the clamor was going to be, not just nationally, but worldwide for FaceTime with these three new heroes. And there was a fair level of hysteria and NASA's PR wing had to actually scramble to keep up with this unexpected inflow of mail and telegrams and interview requests and media requests, and especially different states and different senators and congressmen and different countries wanting the astronauts to come and visit. So upon their release from the relative quietude of, of quarantine, were they able to write up their mission reports and really sort of reflect on what had happened. They were thrown into this maelstrom that lasted for months. Of uh, They had a parade down Broadway. They had a parade in Houston. They had the Broadway in New York. They had a parade in Houston. They had a huge dinner in Los Angeles at the uh, Century Plaza Hotel here with the president and the uh, Governor Reagan, and I think representatives from 60 countries or something, that number, all wanting to just, you know, basically walk up and touch these guys and share their glow for a moment, of course, get their pictures taken with them. And they were each, in a different way, not quite cut out for that. So Collins is probably the most comfortable because he was this very social guy. But he wasn't the primary target of the media interviews. They wanted to talk to the moonwalkers, and Armstrong in particular, because he was, quote, the first man, even though he and Aldrin clearly landed at the same moment, trained together, flew together, and spent time together on the surface. Because Neil took the first step, he was the the primary target of interest. And he was very uncomfortable in the limelight. So it was an exhausting whirlwind of activity. Aldrin was probably even more uncomfortable. And was also, Armstrong was uncomfortable in a sort of a neutral way. He just wanted to get on with it. He was ready to retire from NASA, and he wanted to go back into academia, which he did. Uh, Aldrin was a little conflicted because of, uh, I mentioned earlier, this this father of his, who 
was constantly on him to do more, do more, do more. Nothing was enough. And he was struggling with, what do I do next? Uh, because the other two, uh, Collins went to work for the State Department for a while after all the hoopla died down. And then went on to run the National Air and Space Museum at the Smithsonian and finally ended up in business and then retired. But Aldrin really didn't quite know what to do. This had been a, a lifetime high and he didn't have any immediate plans. And he had a bit of a struggle, which he wrote about very eloquently in a couple of books with this. Uh, he had depression. He, he had some struggles with, with uh, substance abuse, alcohol in particular. And his marriage was facing challenges. And it was really a tough time for a man who had always relied on his brain power and his aggressiveness to get things done. And now these very traits were the ones that were failing him. So of the three of them, I think he went through the most dramatic arc, but he came out of it very strongly and very successfully. He went on to have this incredible career in the media. He was on Dancing with the Stars. He was on 30 Rock, you know, one show after another, making these appearances from the early 70s on, uh, which the other two guys kind of eschewed. They weren't really interested in being in the limelight, at least not in that way. And Buzz kind of went on to become the elder statesman of, of Lunar Flight. So uh, they each took their different trajectories, but fortunately ended up in good places and solid marriages with, with good families that were intact and kids that grew up to do incredible things and are just really, if you ever have a chance to meet the children of the three of them, they're all just wonderful, engaging people that had their own challenges growing up. And you can imagine growing up in the, in the afterglow of these three great heroes as, as they were widely perceived was not easy, but they, they found their own career paths. A couple of them were in the sciences and did quite well. So I think it's a very happy ending to a very complex story. And we'll probably never see another one like it until the first crew comes back from Mars. Well, with that, Rod Pyle, thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm going to step off the land now. That's one small step for man. One giant leap for mankind. about Rod's book and about Apollo 11, please see our show notes at shapingopinion.com. If you enjoyed this episode, please let people know by leaving a rating and review and Apple Podcasts. You can subscribe to the Shaping Opinion podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to your podcasts. We'd love to hear from you. On Twitter, just tweet to us at Shaping Opinion. Or you could get in touch with us through our website, shapingopinion.com. We have a Facebook group that you can join, a Facebook page you can follow, and we're on Instagram at Shaping Opinion. Shaping Opinion is a production of O'Brien Communications. This is where we talk about people, events, and things that have shaped the way we think. Until next time, I'm Tim O'Brien. Mm-hmm.